Good day learners and welcome to our next module in the grade 12 CAT syllabus for theory and we're dealing now with module 1.2 which is hardware devices. So we're going to look at hardware devices within the information processing cycle, um, those that deal with input, output, storage and communication. So you can see this whole thing is dealing with the information processing cycle. Now if we remember correctly, our information processing cycle consists of input, processing, output, storage, and then we have communication as well. So they just give us a few examples, and we're going to go through this in detail, of some hardware devices that relate to input, some that relate to processing, output, storage, and communication. Right, so don't forget, what does a computer do? It takes data and processes it, processes it into information. This is what this is all about. So in our information processing cycle, when we start with input, this is planning the data that needs to be collected, deciding on the best way to capture that data, planning and creating maybe data capture forms, whereas output is dealing with sending um, this directly to storage, communicated directly to other computers, used as input for other programs, systems or parts of the same program and used to control equipment or devices. So this is the input, this is the output. So now we can look at combining input sources and output destinations. So most ICT systems use multiple input sources and output destinations. Let's look at an example. A smartphone or tablet may have sensors to detect movement and allow you to touch. They also have on-screen controls. Look at your point of sale system. Specialized TIL keyboard, barcode scanner, card reader or fingerprint scanner. So they've got multiple input sources. Musicians might connect using a MIDI piano keyboard, computer using USB uh, and a keyboard and mouse. Again, multiple input sources. What about processing? Well, processing takes place only when software and data are loaded into RAM. And this uses a step-by-step -step solution, otherwise known as an algorithm. And it uses data that has been input, creates information that can be output. Remember, processing is in the middle here. We've got input, processing, and then output. So typical you know, tasks involved are things like searching, sorting, comparisons and decisions, mathematical calculations, things like that. That is where processing comes in. And then we look at storage. Where are we going to be saving this to? We need to choose the correct storage media. We need to use security to protect sensitive data. We need to create good and implement, not just create and implement, good backup policies and also create and use storage of non-IT related media, right? In other words, manual input forms. So there are different ways that we can end up storing all of this. Let's go now further into our input devices. So the most common input device we know is our keyboard. We've got our mouse, but we're looking mainly at our, our keyboard. This is the first step in any information processing system. And what you'll see this year now is the fact that when we look at our keyboard, we're looking at what it's used for. So for example, to type in text, give commands. The advantage, it's the fastest way to enter text, easy to learn and use. But we deal now with limitations as well. Okay, we're also going to look at troubleshooting. So not too concerned about what it's used for. Most of us know what these things are used for. We know the advantages, but I want to focus more on the limitations. So a keyboard was never designed to work with a GUI interface, maybe our graphical user interface. It does take up space depending on the size. Can be difficult for some people to use and others need um, some keyboard skills. Now, we're looking at two other things. The first one is, and this is going to be for all of these devices. Why would I buy it? And what type of keyboard am I going to buy? What's going to help me make the decision? Well, I need to look at ergonomic considerations. How much time am I going to be spending on this keyboard? How much time am I going to be spending using this keyboard? Am I going to be doing a lot of typing? Then do I need it to be wired or wireless? Okay. Those are factors that influence me buying a keyboard. These deal with troubleshooting. So 
if anything goes wrong, now sticky keys, maybe I, I press it on the key and it stays down, it stays stuck. Um, I can go and clean that. Maybe the wireless keyboard is not responding. What do I do? I check the batteries. I check the little USB dongle. I check the port. Um, if it's a wired keyboard, I disconnect it. I reconnect it. This is important, the troubleshooting aspect, because these are things that now come up in the scenario questions that you are going to get in grade 12. Our mouse, again, we know what it's used for. We know what we know the advantages, um, the limitations. It's best used at a fixed workplace with a suitable surface area. And the entry level is not that precise or accurate, but it's okay. Now, what are we going to look at again? Factors when buying. Again, ergonomic considerations. Do you want it wired? Do you want it wireless? Right? Those are things that's going to determine which or what type of mouse you end up buying. Like this is an ergonomically designed mouse. Okay, it looks weird, but it does what it needs to. Troubleshooting. Maybe you you know you you've got a bit of a sticky mouse. You need a clean, smooth, non-reflective surface. What if the wireless doesn't respond? Same story. Batteries, dongle, port. Your wired mouse doesn't respond. You disconnect it, reconnect it, maybe try a different port. And your final solution is maybe just to reboot the PC. Okay? Again, these are things we now need to understand because we are going to be asked these things. Our touchscreen. Well, we know what it's used for. We know the advantages. Um, let's look at the limitations. It's not as easy to use as a physical keyboard. Some need extra pressure. Look here. Once your touchscreen needs extra pressure to work, um, you have a problem, okay? The quality of the touch experience depends on the operating system, and we know if you go for the cheaper devices, um, they can sometimes be a little bit more difficult to use um, than the more expensive items, and there's a reason for that. I mean, you pay for the quality. Uh, the screen display area is reduced, especially when you end up typing, and sometimes it's not easy for certain tasks. Then we have our touchpad. Now, our touchpad, this is probably uh, one of the most horrid things that they created. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people don't like it. It's supposed to replace the mouse, um, but it's not as accurate as a normal mouse. It can be difficult for people to use, and it cannot be repositioned. So many people, when they buy these laptops, they end up buying another mouse anyway. Then our scanners. Again, we've been through this. We know what the scanner does. We know its advantages. Um, some of the limitations, some of the disadvantages, we already um, know a lot of that as well. So we have been through those things in terms of the quality of the scanned image. It gets affected by dirt or fingerprints on the glass. Books can be difficult to scan and it can be slow. But we need to look at it this way. Um, some other advantages and uses. Office automation. When we talk about office automation, we're talking about the fact that we can do things in our office environment um, in a simpler way, right? So large documents can be scanned and combined into a single digital file. This is something we've mentioned with the scanner advantages already. Digital copies can save office space. Scanned copies can be emailed. Older documents can be archived. In your point of sale system, it provides quick and accurate input. You just scan with a barcode scanner, you get the price, there you go, done. Other uses, scanning for number plates on cars, access control systems. A lot of this we've already touched on in grade 10 and 11. Now, when it comes to troubleshooting, you can get errors in the image size or quality, but for that you need to check the settings of the scanning software. Then you might get a non-responsive scanning. You need to check number one. I know it sounds stupid, but check if it's switched on. It sounds silly, people, but you know many times things are just not plugged in or switched on. So number two, check if it's plugged in. Check if it's properly connected to the USB port. Check if the lock switches off. Maybe it's not even in the correct port. Maybe that port is not working. Maybe the cable is not working. So those are all the things uh, that you want to check when it comes to your scanners. Then you've got your digital camera. We know what it's used for. We know the advantages. We've been through this in grade 10 and 11. Um, the limitations of the photos are easy to lose. And again, the quality of the photos depends on the quality of the camera. So let's look at some of the buying decisions. When we want to buy a digital camera, and we spoke about this before, we want to look at the resolution. That is going to deal with our quality, right? 
It depends further on what? On the color depth, on the sensor size, on the ISO rating. These are things we need to take into consideration when we are buying a digital camera. Okay, and you can see the ISO rating, the camera sensitivity to light. It means the higher that is, uh, the more clearer the picture will be if you take it in a, an environment that has um, that has low light, right? So I'm sure you've seen those adverts where they show you the camera taking pictures either in the dark or in low light conditions. That relates to the ISO rating. The sensor size, the bigger that is, the more light it can take in, the better that image is going to end up being, especially in low light conditions. Now, there was... Um, there was a whole thing that we used to go through in terms of life before digital. Um, don't really need to know much of that, except for the fact that in the past, this is what we used to use. This was the film that was used in old cameras. Um, we could not view the photos at all until we developed them. I'm sure you've seen those movies where they have dark rooms. Um, you know, they, they're busy putting the photo like in water, in a solution of some kind, and then they've got like a red light. That's how photos were developed before. So we would take photos and we would hope that the photos we took actually come out decently. Then we have our webcams. You know what our webcam is used for? Internet video, live feeds, remote control, security systems, all of this. They are cheap, they are small, um, often built into our portable computers like our tablets and our laptops, etc. But we know that a lot of them have low resolution, so the quality and then there are others that connect via USB, so they have to be connected to an ICT device in order to work. Okay. Now, with our troubleshooting, you might say, well, this thing is unresponsive. Because it's really only got one cable, you need to check if the cable is plugged in properly, if it's switched on, and if it's actually been used by the software as the current camera. Um, with what I'm recording here at the moment with OBS, and you'll probably see me pop onto the screen now. <laughs> there I am. Um, so I can switch that off if I want to. Um, so sometimes they might say, yes, but the camera is not working, and then you just actually haven't switched it on. Okay. Let's go further. The webcam software can be used to test the functionality and to troubleshoot problems. Most of the time, you don't even need special software. It just plugs in and it works. A microphone, um, we know what a microphone is used for, the advantages, giving voice commands, adding sound input, etc. The limitations, your built-in microphones don't give you high quality sound and it can be difficult to use in noisy environments, especially when you are in a Zoom call or a Google Meet and you've got to tell everybody just to uh, mute your mic please because we can hear everything in the background. And then troubleshooting here really um, if you have a USB mic, it's really, have you plugged it into the correct port? Also, is it switched on? Um, have you chosen to use that particular microphone as your input device as well? 